This AlphaWise U30 is an Ender 3 clone, and today we're gonna to find out whether its improvements outweigh its problems. This is an AlphaWise U30 3D printer. AlphaWise is the home brand by GearBest, and it's definitely a Creality Ender 3 clone. The most obvious difference is that it's on stilts, but it's got the same 220 by 220 by 250 millimeter build volume. It's also 24 volts, has a single 0.4 nozzle, and goes for somewhere just under US $200, although only available on GearBest. I mentioned that it has some improvements, and that includes filament runout detection, a color 2.8 inch touchscreen, and a 32 bit ARM based processor in its main board. Why is this out of the printer? Well, more on that later on. There's also some other differences you wouldn't necessarily call improvements. Apart from the stilts, that means a reconfiguration of the electronics and the power supply, which is underneath here. And you might also notice that the part cooling fan arrangement is different, featuring an axial rather than a centrifugal fan. Now I got this printer for free from GearBest and you might be wondering whether people on YouTube give good reviews because I want to keep that type of arrangement going. Well, this video is going to prove to you that I care more about the integrity of my channel than getting any free 3D printers that my experiences with this printer have not been very good at all. And this is gonna be my complete warts and all experience. Let's get started with how it was to unbox and then assemble. True to this product being a clone of the Ender 3, I have to say the assembly is quite similar in terms of the amount of time involved as well as the complexity. All up, it took me around half an hour, maybe a little bit more to get everything together. The instructions, however, are definitely not as user-friendly. Take this step for adding the belt. I know from experience how it will go, but translating what was in the picture to what you see here might not come easily for beginners. Also, some lack of detail in some of the drawing might make parts hard to locate. And worst of all, some steps are completely missing. You can see here that the Z end stop sensor all of a sudden appears with no reference to it anywhere in the instructions. It became apparent early on the quality of the components was not up to par. This bottom section covering the electronics was bent. They hadn't removed the support material from this 3D printed fan shroud. And worst of all, the parts had not been cleaned up at all after being drilled in the factory. There was chunks of loose metal falling off everywhere. Despite this, I got the thing together and used the LCD to access the assisted manual leveling. It's got a system that you've probably seen on other printers where you use a piece of paper, twist the dials, and then use the LCD to move it to the next position. It was time to get test printing and I started with the files on the SD card and the first one I did was this little bullet here. The file name was cryptically called Zadan and it printed pretty well some Z banding but then I noticed some irregular extrusion up the top. Next up I printed this cat which was called a small fox. I mean the overall shape was there but it's hard not to spot all of the missed extrusions around the surface of the model. The last one I did off the SD card was this 3D Benchy, and again, it suffered from the same extrusion problems, but even so, I decided to test partway through the filament runout detection. The under extrusion was prevalent once again, and it's hard to tell if it has any artifacts because the surface quality is already so bad from that. In terms of the filament runout detection, it seemed to resume in roughly the same position, perhaps a little bit higher because you can see the new layer hasn't bonded that well to the old one. The warning signs were already there, but I pressed on deciding to do my own prints with my own profile. Now I'm a simplified 3D user, so I went to the configuration assistant and added a profile for the AlphaWise U20, which is very similar apart from the size. Therefore, I tweaked the size down to match the U30 and proceeded from there. Now this lockpick puzzle is something you've seen on the channel a few times lately, because as I was reviewing this, I was also reviewing the Ender 5. I printed one originally on the Ender 3 and it came out as it's meant to, the center part snapped out without too much effort, meaning you could attempt to complete the puzzle. As well as being a fun puzzle, this is a great print for testing tolerances. I tested the same file in the end of five, and again, I got the same great result. When I tested it on this printer, however, I found that the internal part was fused shut. Unfortunately, the tolerances here were out to the point where the top is starting to snap in half rather than the bottom snap free where it's designed to be. This print also suffered some Z banding issues as well as the under extrusion I was becoming accustomed to. I thought at this point that my problems might be down to my Simplify 3D profile. So I did what I thought was fair, loaded up Cura and imported the profile from the SD card. The other thing I did to be fair was to lower the bed, therefore removing any chance of elephant footing from merging the parts together. 
Unfortunately, this one exhibited the exact same problem. It's fused on the bottom. It's got Z banding and very regular under extrusion. It also snapped in half when I tried to separate it and use the puzzle. I experimented with lowering the flow rate even further, but stopped it early because it was fused once again. My next print was this spiral bars here, and it did finish completely first time round, but it's suffering from really bad under extrusion again. The surface quality is already pretty poor, but when you hold it up to a light, you can see the sections where it's completely see-through. Compare that to this test print done on the end of five around the same time. The exact same model, in the same slicer, same filament, just scaled up to match the 300 millimeter height of the end of five. The difference in quality between them is night and day. To verify that this printer worked fine with Octoprint, which it does, I printed this Christmas tree. But once again, the under extrusion ruined it. At the top, it's extremely brittle and not really a usable print. The artifacts on the back, well, they're not the printer's fault. That was when I was experimenting when I was making my guide to making Octolapses. At this point, I thought it would be best to contact Gearbest to see what they had to say. And they sent me through a help file with instructions on how to lower the VREF for the extruder. I thought this was great because this is a process I've done heaps of times before, so I confidently lowered it to the value that they asked for, but the first time that I tried to extrude after doing this, bang, this thing caught on fire. Luckily, I was sitting nearby. You can see the damage from the smoke and flames on the nearby components, and it's safe to say that this stepper motor driver must have been defective from the start, hence the under extrusion. I contacted Gearbest again. They were very apologetic and promptly sent me out a new mainboard to install in this machine. Fortunately, that was pretty much plug and play because we had the same components and the firmware, although available on the shop page, they had taken the time to pre-install, which I definitely appreciated. So with everything installed, I booted up the printer and decided to run one of the original files off the SD card to remove any chance of the problems I was having coming down to my slicer errors. Therefore, I decided to run the 3D Benchy again. The result, well, definitely improved, but still not fantastic. You can see some subtle zebra skin artifacts and there's definitely still some Z banding on some parts of the boat. The best parts of this boat are quite good. The worst parts of this boat are quite average. I decided to give the printer another chance at this far, so I printed a second one. And although it was a big improvement on what I got from it the first time, it's still not the best print. There are still sections of under extrusion. There's also a really prominent inconsistency along the vertical Z axis. If you get a light and shine it from behind on the two test prints from this printer versus the Ender 5, you'll see just how much better the Ender 5 print is, although of course it's not perfect. I thought I should probably test some different materials, so I loaded up some ABS and I printed this box. And this is probably the nicest print I've got off this machine so far. The LCD lets you put the nozzle up to 250 as a maximum, so that's what I set in my slicing software. And for the most part, it worked okay, but it wasn't quite hot enough because layer adhesion is an issue and the small little splits all around this model. Next up, this die, test printed in PETG. And this is probably the second best print I have on this printer. The shape is formed well and there's no under extrusion, although there's still inconsistent extrusion. My last test print was in TPU and it was this little giraffe. The extruder had no failures printing this at 40 millimeters per second, but the surface quality is not very nice at all. There's also some pockets of missed extrusion that are going to make this thing weaker than it should be. Definitely not what you'd call a good print. All right then, on to my summary. Let's start with the pros. The first thing that's good about it is the price. Considering all the problems I've had, it would be an absolute nightmare if this thing was more expensive than equivalent machines. The filament runout sensor is welcome and it's implemented in a fairly neat way where it's naturally in the path of the filament on the way to the extruder. But probably my main highlight for this printer is the color LCD screen. I much prefer the layout and the commands available compared to something like an MKS TFT. Take for example the option to have continuous load and unload, which helps a lot when dealing with filament changes. Now the 32-bit board should have been an asset for this printer. It seems like it's pretty nice quality. It's got a really big heat sink for the MOSFED. Ultimately the results don't prove that it's worthwhile at all. Onto the negatives. And first and foremost, you can't ignore the inconsistent print quality I had on this thing. Actually, inconsistent is too complimentary. I had poor, poor print quality on this thing. This includes the gaps in extrusion that I experienced, as well as the Z banding, and I think the part cooling is not really the best either with that change of fan style. You'd have to say that safety is an issue. This one did actually catch on fire. And also when I tested for thermal runaway protection, I found that it recognized the problem, but it didn't bother to cut power to the hot end. Therefore, it'll tell you as it's burning your house down. 
Now there's some weird design decisions in this thing. It's probably comes down to personal taste, whether you like the look of it being up on stilts, but the decision to put some things at the back that should be at the front, I simply can't understand. The power switch, fair enough, but why would you ever put a micro SD card slot at the back of the machine where you can't see it? It makes for very, very awkward usage indeed. I should also note this ribbon cable is far, far too long and I've actually needed it a little bit when I changed the main board. Normally it's spewing out to the side and getting in the way any time that you move the printer. Now the bed surface is imitation build tack, but it's mounted on a really thick piece of glass. It begs the question, why didn't they just have glass as the print surface? Because these clips are in the way, but even if we remove things, we can't flex it to get the part off. One other less obvious thing is that compared to the Ender 3, there's enough differences in the x carriage design that you can't use any of those parts already available in the community. That includes things like mounts for BL Touch, Easy ABL, as well as part cooling fan upgrades. Now let me make this clear, I'm not hating on AlphaWise or saying every AlphaWise printer is bad, but I can only review what's in front of me. I could have done some work with my expertise to try and improve these problems, but in my opinion I should review a printer stock especially if it's being advertised as beginner friendly on the product webpage. I really hope mine was the bad exception and other people aren't getting ripped off. That'd be the worst thing around. Although I did find one more example on YouTube of someone suffering the same extrusion problem as me. Given all of the problems I've had with this printer, I simply can't recommend it. If you really want to check it out, the link is in the description below, but I don't know why you would bother when there's so many other comparable machines around that have performed so much better than this during my reviews. Having said that, before this came, I already had it promised to a friend who's going to start their 3D printing journey, so you might expect a video from me in future on how I fix this up and make it as user-friendly as possible for a beginner. Have you used this printer? What have you heard about them? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.